Three, two, one. Hey guys, welcome back to the Way Podcast with your host Sajin Marwar. This week we have a very special episode. Usually I feature a lot of my close friends that I've met in high school and maybe in middle school. But on this episode we have someone who has impacted my life um, very deeply. His name is Kru Yai Nick Bautista. Um, He's my martial arts instructor, my Muay Thai instructor. I've known him for close to eight years now. And on this episode, we're going to talk about the way of a martial artist. Um, and it sounds like a very general question or a general kind of thing. And I guess we could start out with how we got into martial arts. Um, would you like to start, Crew? Yeah, um, there's the standard answer. And then there's the uh, there's the interesting answer. The standard answer is that I was six years old, and my dad took me to uh, karate, and I watched <laughs> Van Damme movies like every night, uh, up until I was about maybe like ten. I did like karate and taekwondo, and then um, went through high school, got too cool for that, and I was playing basketball. <laughs> uh, and then when I realized that. I might be a little undersized for the NBA. Um, I went back to martial arts, but with different reasons. Um, I was lost for a little bit. Um, just got caught up in partying and just, you know, doing lost things. And on my 21st birthday, I um, I just woke up. It's funny because on that night, all my friends were calling me or texting me and calling, hey, hey, where's the party at? Let's go, let's go, let's go. I just finished the work, a shift at work. I think I was working at Foot Locker at the time. And then um, for some reason, I just fell asleep. I fell asleep through all the calls, everything. And I woke up at like 2.30 in the morning, looked at my phone, like 25 missed texts and calls. And I was like, ah, oh, shoot, I missed it. And I just, I went downstairs to get a bowl of cereal. I was hungry and I, I looked at myself in the mirror and clear as day. I was like, I'm going to be a professional martial artist and that's that. And, you know, from 21, I kind of bounced around from style to style. Um, I started out with, um, I went back to karate for a little bit, um, met an instructor there who I thought was my mentor, um, but was actually a predator. Um, you know, did me dirty, taught me the opposite of what I thought martial art was, was supposed to be. I, I thought martial art was this place where virtuous people uh, were also effective people. Um, but this particular experience was the opposite. And um, it took my life savings from me. Um, you know, I felt used, but I also got some good experience uh, working and training at their place. And <clears throat> that relationship kind of dissolved and um but i wanted vengeance it's like uh <laughs> it was literally like a van damme movie you know somebody does you wrong and <laughs> one man against the world and i was like you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go beat him up <laughs> uh so i wanted to go learn muay thai because um muay thai was known to be kind of like this no frills straight to the point martial art there's only four moves. You punch, you kick, you knee, you elbow, you do it hard. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, I felt like uh, as much as I was taken advantage of, I also I also felt like martial art had, had failed me. That uh, it didn't make me a strong and decisive person. That it made me a vulnerable person uh, and not very effective. So I went all the way to the opposite end. And uh, along that path, I met uh, Master Suchark, who's my teacher still to this day. And um, he just taught me the art in its, its purest form, like no holds barred, no, you know, just bare and raw and, and to the point. And he gave me that, uh, that mentorship and that uh, leadership I think I was craving for as a, as a young man. And what I found is over time training with him and, you know, 
most sparring with his fighters. And at the time, he had the most world champions in Muay Thai. And he's he's still arguably the most uh, notable martial art teacher in North America or Muay Thai in, in North America. And as time passed, my anger towards my first uh, my first mentor started to dissipate. Um, I was like, man, I could I could focus on revenge, but it just that felt so small in comparison to what I was seeing from this old man. And what I saw was uh, Masters Two Chart not only building champions, but he was building regular people who became instructors, who opened their own gyms, created a livelihood for themselves, who created an entire community around. Because Muay Thai in the 90s was kind of unheard of. It was very niche. So to see the community that he built was was beautiful. And that's what I was after. That's what I really wanted to know. That's That's why I went to my first mentor. And that's why they failed me is because they didn't really build the community. They... I think they got, um, they lost their way a little bit and all they focused on was money and their their morals and their management. Uh, they kind of diluted their values along the way. So Master Suchart and Muay Thai helped me, helped me grow up and, and find my own way, so to speak, because uh, revenge is not a way, it's it's, a, it's an emotion that can take you off of your way and set you on a whole different path in life. Uh, one that isn't necessarily healthy for us. So that's how I got, uh, that's how I got started in, in, in martial art and in Muay Thai, you know, and I'm, and I, I'm glad I met him. It's one of the most significant things in my life. And so, um, it's an honor to say, it's an honor to hear when you say that um, you're honored to know me because honestly, I never, I never looked at myself in that way. I looked at Master Suchar in that way. So to have other people look at me with that, with a similar, similar sentiment is, is, um, is humbling. So thank you. I mean, I'm, I mean, every, every time I, I say it, like, I, I mean it a hundred percent, you know, I guess starting with, I guess my story. Mm-hmm. Um, so my dad was a martial artist as a as a kid. Yeah, he did um, taekwondo back in the eighties when it was legit. You know, everyone got knocked out, <laughs> <laughs> and and he always told me about like when I was younger how he used to do taekwondo back in the day. It was all, and then he stopped when his instructor had left. Uh. And, um, and I was always something like I always loved, like as a kid, you know, you love fighting movies who does like, I watched like Jackie Chan movies and all that. And that's where a lot, you know, a lot of people get interested in martial arts Mm -hmm. from. Yeah. And, um, I remember the first time I actually went to start trading. Uh, well, my dad took me to a Taekwondo school, um, one time and, uh, and it was kind of like, I didn't know it at the time, but if I look back, it yeah. was one of those like money making machines where you have the students, you just get the higher <laughs> rank students to teach the class. Yeah. You, you let them do everything, you know, and you, you just, yeah. And you charge for every incremental increase in belt and all right. that. And uh, my dad didn't like that because he's from that old school. You got, you know, where they're actually teaching them. Um, yeah. So that was kind of scrapped that idea. I didn't, I didn't end up doing it. And, um, mm. I think when the same year I started Muay Thai, I get, okay. I guess for those who don't know what the martial art of Muay Thai is, mm-hmm. it, there's a long, long history about it. But I guess if you don't mind giving it, I guess a short explanation crew, uh, on what it is. Right. So Muay Thai is the national sport of Thailand. Um, so it's so you have to wonder how far back to go but yeah. it's the national sport of thailand uh in every every ancient country to understand the history of martial art or, or to understand the history of muay thai you have to understand the history of martial art so in the history of, of martial art is simply 
um, the self-defense competencies that each tribe used to defend themselves and their tribes. And by self-defense, I mean an era before guns, uh, before weapons were uh, made into technology. So this is before guns and this is before formal police and, and military. Uh, each tribe was kind of on their own. China had their tribes, Thailand had their tribes, Philippines had their tribes. In China, the tribes used Kung Fu. Philippines, uh, they used Kali and Eskrima stick fighting and knife fighting because they lived in the jungle. Um, and same with Thailand. So when Muay Thai first started, it wasn't called uh, Muay Thai, it was called Pan Lam. Pan Lam, uh, roughly translated in English, means it means everything. It means circle, circle meaning everything. So you do whatever it is that you have to do to protect yourself. Now, when police and the military was invented and now violence was illegal from a civilian point of view, and now that violence is only legal for the police and military to use with just cause, now you had a public that had all these fighting skills but wasn't necessarily legal to use. And that's for every country. What happened to all these fight skills? These fight skills filtered into sport. So in the context of Thailand, uh, what was Pan Lam uh, eventually became Moi Kad Chuak. Moi Kad, Kad Chuak is hand wraps, hand wraps fighting. You've seen this in Kickboxer and Van Damme's movies. Uh, and then rules got even more formalized and became Muay Thai. Um, Muay meaning unity, Thai meaning of the people. Or simply translated uh, Thai boxing. So what happened was the king of Thailand, or the prince, uh, prince Rama the Seventh, um, the princes of Thailand got their education in, in England. And when they were in England, they saw the Queen, the Marquis of Queensbury boxing. They saw formal boxing, rings, uh, weight classes, referees, boxing gloves, uh, and they adopted that in Thailand. And now you see Muay Thai become a sport. Uh, legend has it that um, a prisoner uh, named Nai Kanom Tom. Um, he was held in the prisoner in the border of uh, Burma and Thailand. And I think the boss of the prison offered freedom to Nai Kanom Tom, a Thai, should he knock out nine people or a set of people. Where does he knock out nine people using Muay Thai, punch, kick, knee, and elbow? And he was granted his freedom. I think at the time, prisoners were granted clemency through... Uh, combat um but that's kind of the myth that goes along with the with the story of muay thai but essentially the sport of muay thai and the techniques of muay thai is uh, four things punching kicking kneeing and elbowing currently it's seen from a sport context but historically it was used for personal self-defense uh combat against a person or and or persons and now we practice it today to stay in shape, have fun, and be able. <laughs> yeah. What? So that's a short um, history lesson, I guess, on the art of Muay Thai. Yeah. So um, going back to how I started, I remember I was in sixth grade. One of my friends, I, I, I don't want, I'm not going to say his name, but he, uh, <laughs> he was always talking about how he loved boxing like he loved watching muhammad ali yeah mike tyson um and i was like you know what it sounds pretty cool like i checked out some clips of boxing you know on my ipod <laughs> and um i was like oh this is pretty cool and i asked dad because he i had already done you know like those trial lessons i used that you do have to do for other martial arts yeah. schools and i was like you know right. what Maybe I'll try boxing, you know, like I feel like uh -huh. it'll be something cool. And then dad took that and he he researched himself. Uh, what is the most effective martial art for self-defense? 
<laughs> I mean, like every father, <laughs> every parent would do, right? And um, that's a lawyer, right? Yeah. So he asked questions. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so he did his research and then he came upon the art of Muay Thai. Yeah. And I remember the first day I went in for that, we were at the, your second location, I think on yeah by the tracks and right, uh, Williams Berkeley. and um <laughs> i remember going in and i was like this is cool like there's like all these people training together and making all the yeah. but i was like what are they, all these weird noises and stuff and then like shh, yeah. shh, shh. and yeah. i remember okay. i remember you came up to me and you had like your shaved head <laughs> it was, it's, and um yeah for those who are listening uh crew has has been rocking the ponytail the long long hair for a while uh, yeah but uh i remember you came up to me and you said i've always been shy like I, as a kid yeah. and um you came up to me and you said my dad you know asked like we're here for the the just to take a look you know and i remember you said to me say hey you're in pretty good shape you work out and stuff I remember you saying that to me and I was like, I remember so seriously. I was like, no, I uh, no. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't, I do not. And, um, yeah, that was the first time that I had met you. And then yeah. after that, you know, I started coming to class. I remember my first class with some of the, some of the original kids students back then, like Lucas mm -hmm. and all those guys. And, yeah. um, I remember learning and I was like, this is, I found it so interesting, you know, it's just fun. Like as a kid, we're naturally like, what's fun more fun as a kid than hitting something, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. um, yeah. I'm and, allowed to be yeah, saying no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I won't get in trouble, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I started training maybe, I guess three years, three years in, um mm -hmm. is when i really started to take it a, like a lot more serious um that's when i started sparring with the adults um and that th yeah that was that one that one thing that muay thai did it gave me the confidence that i needed for real like before i've always been shy yeah and um like knowing like i probably thinking about it like back then it's like oh i could handle myself like, but I'm like 12, like an adult, but like, it, obviously that's a different case, but in your mind, it's like, you know what? I, I don't need to, why do I have to be so shy? You know, like there's no right. reason to be afraid to speak up just in conversation, you know, to right. order something at a fast food restaurant. Right. Right. So I really get like to be able to hold my head up high, walk confidently. And when I turned 14, I started sparring with the adults and that's when I really, my love for Muay Thai just, it just went up exponentially. Yeah. From there, I started, I said some of the most pivotal, I think pivotal moments in my personal development during that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I remember, okay, I think it was one year in, maybe one year in, I was, mm -hmm. I was like the only, I guess, kid there. And I'm, I'm pretty light, I weigh, 130 pounds and I'm not short, but I'm not tall either. So, um, uh -huh. I was definitely the smallest guy there. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it was a few years before more of the teens started coming. And, um, mm -hmm. I was always like, I guess the underdog in my mind, you know, and uh -huh. I had to, you know, going against grown men, right. They're not trying to hurt. That's not the culture we have. We had there, but you know, it's just in your mind all the time. And I remember I used mm -hmm. to go, like, I mean, it taught me to be tough. I, I, I hate that. I kind of don't like that thing. Cause that's like, oh man, that's all those boxers say. And they, they end up not being able to speak, you know, and by the time they're 50, but, um, yeah, it taught me to be like, if I can handle this, you know, what else, what, what, like, is anything else going to be as difficult as this? You know, like it gave me even more confidence. And I remember right. one day I was sparring with Al, the fateful day. Uh -huh. Oh my God. I wrote, yes, oh, it was, I remember cause, um, cause I remember Al threw me probably 30 times in the clinch cause he was being nice. Right. He didn't want to hurt me yeah. cause I didn't know 
I thought because when you first, for those who don't know, when you first start sparring, you always you think you have to go hard all the time. Like you like you're so tense. You come out like with your shoulders stuck in one spot, and you're just trying to survive in your mind. Right. And at that point, I was like always in survival mode. I still enjoyed it, but I was still in survival mode because I was like, oh man, I'm smaller. This guy kicks kicks me, and it hurts a lot more than I kick when I kick him. So. I was in that mode. I never remember. I got thrown a million times because the person I was sparring with, Al, he's very, he's a, he's a very nice guy. We could call him Papa, right? <laughs> and um, I remember him tossing me a thousand times, and I remember just like just going hard. He would just walk through everything, and then I was like, okay, let me try and this is a mistake. I was so tired. I, I tried to bait him. I leaned forward on my left leg to try and get bait him to kick my leg and then I would counter. But the problem yeah. is I couldn't take the first kick <laughs> inside, like inside low kick, boom, leg out Bro. on the ground. I was like, I saw white, <laughs> I saw white in my eyes. I was like, Oh man. And then <laughs> I got up and I, I was like, okay, let me take a break. You know, like, and then, and then Papa is like, Oh, you know, you can chill. Like we don't need to go hard. And I was like, yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. And then I, I go to the washroom. I look at myself. Maybe my eyes are beat red. They're just, and my body, the adrenaline, just the dump after it was just horrible. I think I, I started crying and I couldn't like I couldn't speak properly. I remember, I remember crew. I you took me to took me aside and let me just get get it Process. out. Yeah. Yeah. And that that moment was like the switch it was just a switch in my mind it's like why why do i need to hit hard all the time why do i need to <laughs> smash with all these guys you know like i don't need to and after that point i was like you know what it's better for my development it's better for my health my mental health you don't need to go hard all the time and that's when i really started to i think get better to be honest and yeah, after that point, you know, more, more teens started coming, you know, and then it just progressively got more experience and then we had to move. <laughs> yeah. And then we were doing right when your passion was at its peak. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. And then, you know, what though, I would say, I don't think, I don't really think martial art makes anybody confident. Your parents made you confident. You know, I can mm -hmm. tell by your father and by your mother, your sense of self and your sense of stability came from them. I think all that all that martial art does is gives you gives you a stage to express your confidence. Because when we're young, there's so many different stages: school, work, being a brother, being a son, uh, being a friend. There's all these different roles that you play. And at first, the stage or hats, they shift so much that you don't really know how to orient yourself on each one. Martial art is a good basic place to understand how to express your confidence because the most basic place that is, is, mm -hmm. is a fight. Like it doesn't get any more basic than that. And if you can learn how to find your confidence in there, um, now you're more able to understand the different stages in your life and how to express your confidence through there. So that experience that, that you talked about, I think it wasn't so much that it gave you confidence or even took confidence away. It just gave you an understanding of what is the right way to express my confidence in this situation. And I remember that, I remember that time period and, and you chose the right thing. Because a lot of people in that area would have been overwhelmed by the confusion that they would have just withdrawn. Um, but you shed all the extra weight. You shed you, you shed all the fiction in your mind as to what fighting is and what it isn't. And you chose to just be curious. And that's true confidence to me. If you're confident enough, a truly confident person in themselves is not afraid to admit that they're wrong for a moment 
and won't turn being wrong for a moment as a judgment of themselves that as if being wrong is, uh, you know, uh, deficient in any manner. Because you got after that session, I do remember you becoming a lot more curious and a lot more teachable. And as a result, you got so much better and you accepted your size and started to learn how to use your body much better. You didn't overcommit. You attacked in waves and for short waves because you didn't want to get caught uh, in battles that you didn't need to, to be a part of. So all that confidence was already there from your parents. It's just you just figure out how to now apply it, you know. I'm a, I use I use a Mac. I'm a Mac user for life. <laughs> but if you give me an Android, man, it's a confusing experience. But I still know the point of technology. So eventually, once I adapt to the software, I know how to use it. Is is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And that's what confident people do. That even if something is somewhat different to what they're used to, the same basic principles of life are there, and you know they adapt. That was a fun time. Yeah. And then you moved. Yeah, then we, then we, <laughs> then we moved. And I mean, we couldn't need to train, but COVID is when it really, really, I guess, halted for a minute. And I think mm -hmm. that's when I really started to delve into study of Muay Thai. Like, I've always been interested in many different martial arts, just learning. Because, you know, Muay Thai is it's just one it's just like if you think about it, it's just one way of doing things you know everything works in a vacuum right in the right situation this will work um and we can always i mean online there's always arguments this martial art that martial art this will kill someone that's not going to do anything you know these kicks don't hurt <laughs> and i think that you, if it's really like the philosophy of this podcast if you can look to someone else who's doing something different and see from how they're from their perspective and try to apply that to your own situation i think it's very valuable and i started to delve a lot more into that especially the last two years as i couldn't yeah. train right i could I, we had a, we had a bag at home and i would train every every um every day every few days because i mm. at that point like you can't get rid of it you know it's just part of your life um yeah and i'm glad you're still training you should keep studying and I really started to delve into Muay Thai more, um, not mm -hmm. just like, like, because I always love, you know, watching old school K1 and, you know, San Chai and all these amazing, famous fighters. But then I really started looking at the golden age a lot. Oh, a lot. okay. What are you watching? I mean, I, I don't know how many, I've watched a lot. I mean, I mean, yeah. Diesel Noy is, I mean, Diesel <laughs> Noy is... I mean, his nickname is a sky piercing knee, which is the sickest name. I mean, you can receive. I mean, S Samat. I mean, Somrak. I mean, and then one of my. Have you watched um, Nam Kabuan? Oh, Nam Kabuan is one of my favorite. He died recently. No, he... Yeah. So sad. You know what his nickname is, eh? His nickname is the Ring Genius. Yeah, he definitely looks like it in the ring. It's, yeah. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, that's a great area to watch. What did you learn? A lot. It's just so interesting as someone who's, you know, interested in martial arts and looking, like, just looking at the history of how it's changed the expression, the physical expression of it. You know, Muay Thai had its own kind of look, very different silhouette back then to now. Mm. I mean, all of the Golden Age fighters, they always complain about, oh, everyone's too flat-footed now. They just stand and they, it's all about power. I mean, that's it's, yeah. if you think of it, it's kind of like the old generation. Oh, you know, it's better to do it like this and you young folks don't know. But, I mean, there is some... It's just a, a different expression of the art and it's evolved over time. Like, as we said, Muay Thai's, the sport of Muay Thai is like almost 100 years old, maybe over 100 years old. And, mm -hmm. you know, you look at Muay Thai matches from the 60s and 50s, it's like it had its own physical ex expression. And mm -hmm. from the 80s and 90s when we had the Golden Age, that had its own expression. I think I was watching um, Sylvie Van Douglas on, on YouTube, Oliver, some of the most amazing t like videos uh, on Muay Thai. Right. 
and they're talking about how it's like the golden age fighters they they don't bounce like the ones from the 50s and 60s they're not bouncing mm -hmm. they're sway they're very they're swaying they're floating as they would say like kind of hot yeah he was he would always he'd float he wouldn't yeah. he wouldn't bounce mm -hmm. and i really i really got interested in that during um the pandemic and right which is weird because I usually like there's a lot of different styles in Muay Thai. A lot of people, a lot of people just think Muay Thai is you know put your hands up, bounce your le lead leg, throw a teep, throw kicks. You don't know how to punch, you know how to throw knees. Like that's like an assumption of someone who doesn't know or mm -hmm. hasn't done Muay Thai. Maybe from the from the outside, right? But right. Muay Thai has its own. If you, when you have so many, when you have so many, I guess parts of one art. There's going to be people who specialize, especially when it's a sport. There's going to be people who specialize in one um, sort of style, like and mm -hmm. like you know, there's a there's a bunch of different ones, but I guess most famous probably Moi Cow and Moi Femur. And um, mm -hmm. I really started to appreciate Moi Cow a lot. And um, for those who don't, Moi Cow is kind of like the forward walking knee fighter, and um, yeah, they just plow through. And a lot of like in I. I I heard from a lot of these discussions um, on this person, Sylvie Von Douglas's channel, that in Thailand, they, they were considered like, oh, he's the bull, the dumb bull that walks forward. And the Moi Femur, which is kind of like the very evasive and technical and beautiful fighter, is like the matador, yeah. you know, trying to, trying to trick him and land something on him. But I really uh -huh. appreciate the, started to appreciate the complexity especially of the clinch. I've always been interested in the clinch throughout Muay Thai, right. like my own time training. Mm -hmm. And really like last two years, I've really dove deep. Like there's so many levels to, you know, if you could, if you want to specialize in the, you can, there's so many levels, like just look at boxing, just two fists you're using. Right. But this, it's such a developed art form, a developed combat sport. And the, the Thai clinch is, you know, everyone knows. The, the, some people just call this the, do, the two hands on uh, as the the tie clinch, right? But um, there's so many levels to the to the game, and I mm -hmm. think as someone who's been doing it for a while, you know, it's one way to keep interested in it, like learning about all these things. Because yeah. there's so much, there's always more to learn. You know, I've started mm -hmm. since I I, I didn't want I, I started going to this gym nearby. Um, we tried a few gyms in our area, but you know, we didn't like okay. them. And we had a family friend, uh, a yeah. close family friend, like like brothers and sisters to us. Yeah. And they recommended this place out in Burlington. And I'll shout them out. They're uh, BTC, Bur mm -hmm. Burlington Training Center. And um, don't they do like MMA shows as well? I've heard yeah, that, yeah. that acronym. They, yeah. they do a lot, a lot of the uh, MMA shows yeah. in Ontario. Okay. And um, yeah. they recommended it. They said, because he was... I cut, yeah. Well, let's just call him my cousin. He was very interested in it, and I kind of like gave him an introduction, and he started right. training like hardcore, like every day, three hours. He he's a little, little too sometimes a little too into stuff, where he right. trains himself. But I started to train. You know, now I've always had interest in grappling arts. You know. Okay. So they offer jujitsu there. So I've started. I started jujitsu no gi jiu-jitsu there and um and you know it's it's one thing i think you you know a lot about this about is about the you can tell when the connection between a teacher and their students is there you know mm -hmm. and a lot of these places they are just there for the money you know like i mean i understand you got to make money but i feel like at some level you have a responsibility especially when you're teaching kids you know, you have a responsibility as someone who is, you could potentially be looked at as a mentor, as you are to me, as your master is to you, and you have influence on them. And right. I just, you know, I didn't like a lot of these gyms. They're just like, it's fine. People want to get to go there, just get a workout in, you know, they don't, they just want to hit pads, hit the bag. That's fine. You know, but I didn't want, I didn't want that. Yeah. You know, I don't want to go to a gym where, okay, they, do, they only care about the very casual hobbyists and the yeah. highest level 
professional fighters and there's no in between you know like oh we right. we, we we invest interest in you on let if you're gonna fight right and that's one thing that i love about this new place i'm at is um they care about each person you know it doesn't matter yeah. what your goal is and that's one thing i found just a shout out um <laughs> just a shout out where i trained before with you crew brampton muay thai in brampton as the name uh-huh. suggests currently i think you're part of the trini health collective um yeah that's right and yeah you know i and you, you talked about building a community rather than just not only building a fighter you know right yes that's something i can never i'll never lose like i'll never lose that connection i have to brampton muay thai like i go to this yeah. i go to this new gym and it's there's a lot of nice people there i'm just getting into it you know um but that'll always be there that you'll always be my muay thai instructor you'll always be my yeah. crew you know yeah and um <laughs> There's actually a specific reason for that. Um, whenever in, in teaching, teaching is like such a interesting subject, not just teaching martial art, just like teaching in general, actually not in general, it's in specificity. There's two types of knowledge that happens when, uh, when we share information with one another. One is tacit and one is called explicit. So explicit is like, <clears throat> the hard facts of the situation, the technical facts. Here's how you kick, here's how you punch, how you knee, how you elbow, how you hold pads, where you step, where you put your weight, how you transfer your weight, where you deliver your power is all explicit knowledge. But then tacit knowledge is the knowledge that is shared and the knowledge that we learn that can't really be written down. It's kind of like, uh, you know how your grandma has recipes to things, but it's not written down, but nobody can make it like her because she just has a feel for the situation. Or, you know, let's say you're down and you don't even know why you're down, but your parents know. Mm-hmm. Not only do they know what to say to you, but they know how to say it and they know when to say it. And they don't themselves even know when or what to say, but they just know it in the moment. It's just like a connection of intuition and <clears throat> this is why bonds are, are very important because when you have a good bond with your teacher, you get the best of both worlds. You get the right explicit information and the right tacit information. And sometimes what can happen in, uh, in the business of, of martial art is you can over commodify what you do and, uh, the pursuit of profit, uh, if uninhibited, the uninhibited pursuit of profit um, will subconsciously uh, sacrifice that tacit information and everything becomes very explicit. So now the learning can feel impersonal and cold because all you're learning is facts about things, but you're not teaching uh, the tacit information. You know, I think uh, the best teachers in any subject know how to nourish the heart alongside nourishing our minds so, and and it seems like they just do it simultaneously. You know, when I when I train with Ajahn, our training sessions was always followed with like a thirty to forty five minutes, sometimes an hour and a half lecture from him that spanned politics, philosophies, frustrations, knowledge, and it was just all wrapped into. It was just a senior talking to a junior. And the junior just got to like soak it all in, you know, and it's, it's that, that back and forth that makes the learning experience, um, special. So I'm happy if, if wherever you can find that, you know, be it martial art or not martial art, that's when you have something like that, that's a special situation. Yeah. Yeah. And as you're saying, you know, it can, it can be kind of, I don't know, considered rare these days i think it's it's, i think it's always been rare you know it's not easy to be a great teacher um but yeah and that's one thing i really felt like you when we were young like uh, learning from you in the kids class we didn't just learn how to defend ourselves you know we always talked about 
you know, when you walk out, hold your head up high. Be confident in yourself. Be yourself. Don't be afraid to, to express yourself. And it wasn't just about building strong shins and building a strong body, learning these techniques, you know. It's about building yourself up in other ways. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you held those lessons, man. Can you imagine if I got you guys to roll beer bottles over your shins and called that an education? I know. That's some crazy <laughs> stuff, man. I don't know why people... Yeah. I think my camera's frozen, but... Uh... It's okay. I can still hear yeah. you. Let's just, let's just turn it off. <laughs> um, but... Yeah. Um, we kind of... I guess... We kind of covered most of the things I want to talk about, but... Um... Yeah, you got it. This is good. Yeah. I mean, I guess one thing we haven't talked about, I guess, just yet is what keeps uh -huh. us going. Why do we continue with mm -hmm. this on this path of being a martial artist? Mm. What, what, ke what keeps me going as a martial yeah. artist? Yeah. Why, why do you continue to do this? Hmm. Why do I continue to do this? Uh, because I'm a sadist and I love suffering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this path isn't comfortable, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, what keeps me going? Man, there's, it's not that I'm struggling to find a answer. It's just that there's so many reasons to keep going that I'm trying yeah. to filter out what's the most, most important one. Uh, the reasons why we start is not the same as the reasons why we continue. So I shared before my original reason was revenge against somebody. Um, but now my reasons to continue is, you know, I've lived in Brampton since 1989. And um, the city has grown in many ways and has, has receded in many ways. And by city, I mean my community. Um, and as I get older, I start to value that word uh, more and more. You know, our our community is where we reside. It's it's where we grow up. It's where we grow old. It's where our children learn things. Uh, it's where children experience things, and those lessons and their experience and those experiences are just a result of the quality of the people that's in it. Um, there are many reasons as to why I continue one, obviously the, yeah. the, the simplest, the simplest, re the, mo the most obvious one is, you know, I have a submodel business and I, I continue to run it and I continue to run it. But the moral reason as to why is If the only types of businesses that exist are the ones that are about buying and selling goods or providing services that ultimately just serve vanity, then how does the community actually improve from a character point of view? How does it actually improve the experiences of people? A lot of people have mental anxiety. Uh, there are a lot of people going home upset and taking it out on the people inside their homes, you know, and to me, the fight in the modern era is not a U for a UFC belt. It's not even for a sport belt or, or any belt. The fight for, um, in the modern world is, is is just about uh, having inner peace, you know, being comfortable with yourself, yet committed to the challenge of constantly bettering ourselves. So I tend to value martial art over a lot of things because as, as a subject in and of itself, what else out there is there, is there that promises or, or explicitly seeks out to have that type of effect on somebody's lives. Yoga is one that's a popular one. Um, then there's like meditation books and meditation workouts and, and stuff like that. And 
but that's just one avenue but there are more gradations of avenues in there like you could learn a martial art like muay thai and and train as if you're an athlete um but yet have um but at a dosage that actually yields you some peace there are many ways to go about it right so in following my teacher ajan i start to understand the concept of duty um, it's one thing to do a job because of what the job gives you but it's a whole another thing of of doing a job because of what you feel you owe to the people and the places around you uh, a doctor has to do their job because there is a responsibility to give health to society um police have to do their job because there's a duty to keep society safe from itself the military has a job because they have a duty to keep the nation safe from other nations politicians have a job because their duty is to solve things without escalating to violence and we see that a lot today there's so many protests that's happening especially just in the last year you know you, you had black lives matter you had um farmers uh what else did we have hong kong after the farm hong kong what they knows before hong kong. that's right hong kong uh, and then now you have you have the protests against the government for violation of uh, our individual rights uh so i look around and there's just a lot of uh there's a lot of turmoil and i understand where we disagree and if you go online it looks like we disagree everywhere and on anything mm -hmm. you go online everybody is either uh a racist uh a corrupt politician um or whatever mm -hmm. but man one of the special things about a martial art place is that it, none of that matters yeah you know for that, from that moment that you train you're not some brown kid from Brampton and not some filipino kid from from Brampton where where two people who know nothing trying to know a little bit more in the next 90 minutes or the 2 hours that's there and you know when you're hitting things when you're running you're sweating you're doing your push-ups you know your political stances your belief patterns or none of that happens and we remember a very specific a very uh, important adage we can only be as spiritual as we are physical so when we meet on the physical plane everything is is equal and that's one of the things that I've I've loved about martial art is we're equal there. And that's not to say we're unequal in other places, but I'm just saying we need to experience mo more moments of equality than inequality. Because God knows there's a lot of that mm -hmm. too, you know. So if I don't do this, who's going to do it? I mean, I'm sure somebody else is going to do yeah. it. But in the way that I view that it should be done, you know, that's my duty to myself. Uh, that's my duty to my community to uh, to have a vocation that improves my my locale. Um, that's what keeps me going. You know, there's other reasons. You know, at Trinity Collective, we have doctors, therapists, trainers here as well, and they're all my friends. So that's fun. Mm -hmm. um, but the rigors of um, of what it takes to, you know, have a vision and, and, and to execute it uh, comes from a sense of duty that I learned from my own martial art instructor, from my own teacher, Ajan. He, you know, he's in his uh, mid to late 60s now, fierier than <laughs> ever. Um, but that fieriness comes from a clarity of his duty. And as I look at that, I, one of the things that I've learned is duty is critical to a sense of vigor in life. And I've learned that, you know, we get old when we lose a sense of duty. We don't get old just because the number changes. We get old because we have no sense of duty. <clears throat> we lose a sense of what we're trying to give to the people around us. And uh, he's the most liveliest person. Anyway, as you, as you were saying. For sure. Um, so yeah, my motivation for, for continuing just comes from a, uh, a deep sense of duty. 
Uh, when I was 20, I, I was convinced I was going to be the Asian Kobe Bryant. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't that pan out? For obvious physical reasons. But if you really look into it, there was no duty in there. I was just trying to receive stuff. Uh, I want to be rich. I want to be famous. And basketball way is a way to receive those things. But duty is about giving. And, and for me, that's uh, that's giving me much more motivation and much more vigor um, in doing what I do and overcoming the headwinds it takes to do it is is just having a very clear sense of 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 why I'm doing it. That's that was why. very, very eloquently put, uh, put. and, um, yeah, you know, as someone who is, I, I mean, we're both, we're, we're both young, we're always young. And as you said, until we lose our sense of duty and we feel old, <laughs> that's when we feel it. But, you know, as someone who is, you know, moving on to another chapter in their life. Yeah. You know, I think about that often. It's like, you know, obviously, what do I want to do? You know, mm. I'm in commerce. I study. I'm in studying business. I want to start a business. I don't want to work in, you know, some firm. You know, they may. They, I might have a good job, and make good money. I mean, there's always like uh, exceptions, but you know, I want to be able to. I just want to help help someone. You know, I want to be able to help people. And do something significant. Yeah. It's like, I just, it's, it doesn't even, it doesn't even have to be anything big. You know, if, if I can help someone who's struggling with their business that I, if I can set up a website for them, you know, they give me a little, it's not about the money. It's about what well, this website gives them more business, reduces their stress in their life. If I can help someone that way, form a connection, it's all it's already like that's that's why i would do it obviously you know i'm gonna have to support myself and um in financially of course that's always something we always have to think about but i mean i feel like what that's one thing that martial arts has taught me is really i've been humbled by it you know there's so many because since martial arts it's such a in the context of a fight, it's such a simple circumstance in, in terms of you don't have anything else to think about in that moment, you know, as you were saying. It's kind of taught me, like, like the old, people always say, well, like, leave your ego at the door. And, yeah, that's I lost it that day uh, when we were trading, when I was sparring. And it's not about that anymore. Like, it's not about that anymore, you know. It's just, I just want... Martial art. The reason why I stick with martial arts is just, it's not even because I don't think I can lose it at this point. You know, I feel like it's so intertwined. You know, people say, "How do you find time to train?" It's like it's like brushing my teeth. You know, yeah. it's like I have to do it. I just I just have to. I know, like I have to shadow. If I'm standing, if I'm sitting down for more than thirty minutes, get up, shadow fox. <laughs> Always, <laughs> people people are like, "Why are you making all those noises?" But it's like just it doesn't matter you know yeah well one thing that i think might help when i was in your position obviously i chose martial art for my career and not everybody's going to use martial art not everybody's going to choose martial art as their career but an understanding of martial art can help you with uh deciding you know where the first leg of your your journey is one of the things that we learn in martial art is the difference between understanding before you do and doing before you understand. Sometimes in martial art, the, and when you're sparring or when you're fighting or whatever, there's not much room for conscious, weighed decisions where you have time to ruminate on it. There's somebody there in front of you, they're hitting you. Mm -hmm. Like it's happening right now. And if you don't do something right now, you're going to keep getting hit and potentially in a place where you're rendered motionless and that you're unable to hit. And sometimes the best decision is the one that you, that you can execute right now. So I, I'd recommend you to do the same. Just go out and do it. Go out and do something. 
even if it's not something you fully understand yet, as you do it, you start to understand. You'll understand whether you want to keep doing it and get better at it, or you'll understand that this is not something you want to do or get better at, and you need to pivot and, and shift. But just don't do nothing. Mm -hmm. Muay Thai is simple so that it can be effective. Somebody told me about something called Hicks Law. Have you ever heard of that? Hicks Law is uh, when you have an abundance of choice, you're less likely to make a decision. So if you reduce your choices, you're more likely to act. And I would recommend the same thing. Yeah. This podcast is a good start. <laughs> yeah. Start to do it, so do it. You know? Yeah. And um, that that's something that I really have been thinking about recently. I mean, I mean, I, a lot of people don't know this, but I, I kind of had... I don't know if you would call it a scare, but like a health kind of a health scare a couple couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably 2018, 2019. Um, it's um, so, you know, one day I remember coming after sparring, I had a bruise on my rib. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember like it was kept it kept on getting hit and it was kind of like it was like a, a small, like a fleshy, like something, something there on my chest. Right. I remember, and I remember. yeah. And we, we had to adjust, um, for that. And, uh, one day, uh, where I was like, you know what, let's get a, my mom was saying, like, I didn't really care about it. Like my mom was saying, you know what, let's get it removed, you know, like, why not? Mm. And I was like, fine, if you, we'll, we'll get it removed. And, uh, so we got it removed from cosmetic surgeon and mm -hmm. that was like that was my first surgery it was, it was really weird but uh because you're awake and they're like cutting something out of your chest but it's but <laughs> yeah, but you can't feel anything which is it's so weird but um after that point you know they always test they always test something they take out just just to be safe right and um so i didn't know this at the time but there's some signs some cancerous cells sign uh, signs of cancer in the actual mass yeah. right because any mass that develops that isn't like scar yeah. tissue is is from it's a cancer cell like it's like duplicating right yeah a and um i had so, one too right here you can see the scar yeah you had one on your forehead there oh yeah mm. yeah so you know they got it tested and um you know they got it we didn't know the thing is we didn't know if it was good like if it was okay or if it was bad and that moment i was i wasn't worried to be honest my parents obviously were a lot more worried than i was i was kind of like a little bit i know it's a little cheesy but i was kind of in a zen state i don't know what it was but um like i was kind of just what it is it is what it is and i was i remember sitting in the in the waiting room in mount sinai hospital i still have my hospital card i remember sitting there in the in the hallway after i got my mri and we were waiting for the results i remember sitting there just i thought we had to wait 45 minutes and i was just thinking of so many different things like what have i done in my life you know <laughs> and i was like just i was just like thinking super hard you know and my parents were like obviously so worried and um they came in we went in there so it was it was a type of cancer, but it wasn't, it wasn't benign, but it wasn't, it's not the type that spreads, thankfully, right? You know, they're asking me all these questions and they're like, do you have, you have thrown up blood and all these sorts of like very specific signs of it. And I had said no to all of them. And I, because I personally wasn't worried, right? So we don't have a history in our family, but yeah, it was just that moment. I was thinking like, what if, you know, what if it was something? Yeah. And after that point, I thought, he's like, you know what? You know, they say, uh, you know, everyone always says they don't want regrets, right? But after that point, I was like, it could have been something horrible. You know, we I walked by, I had to walk by the cancer treatment chemotherapy sec area of the hospital. It's like, you're so thankful for what you have. So mm -hmm. th that it was nothing. You walk by, these people are bald, skinny, sickly, and, you know, who knows if they're going to make it. And it's like, 
really made me appreciate what I had and made me think, what's the point of really it's not going to be that bad you know i've already that's i've already been through something if i can take it <laughs> i've been hit pretty hard you know it's like if i can do that i don't need to worry about making a decision on something i'll just i'll i'll might i might fail on something but it's better than saying i never did it yeah and yeah. absolutely absolutely one of the, uh somebody asked me what where um Mind you, I've had, I haven't had much fights, um, but somebody asked me recently, like, what's it like being in the ring? And I said, for me, it's a, it a peaceful place. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah. Like, you're so overstimulated with everybody around you. Uh, and there's a, another person in the ring that is there to purposefully hurt you. And they have, they've focused the last five weeks of their life mm -hmm. to just beat the crap out of you. And when you're in that moment, everything that you've been thinking about or worrying about leading up to that ring is just small. Like you're just completely present. And, and even those circumstances are not ideal. What matters is that you're present and it, it just feels peaceful, you know. Um, ideally, the circumstances would be different, but you're still there. So, you know, I'm glad you're okay. Yeah, um, Thank thankfully it wasn't. It wasn't anything. Right, you're okay. I got a nice big scar though. They had to remove some extra stuff, but it's like they have to be even on all sides. It's like it's like this big. Like, so the one thing I would tell you to do is like aim the biggest you could possibly aim at and for yourself, not not for others. And just see what it takes you. For me, this is the biggest thing I could do maybe not in terms of magnitude and what in terms of other people think is, is big, but it is the biggest thing that I could do with my life for myself um, to get to work with my wife every day to start a business alongside my wife uh, and to have work that is meaningful to us and, and the people around us. The only thing that would make this bigger is maybe a couple more dollars at the end of the day. But even if that would happen, it, it wouldn't change um, how our careers feel to us, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I say aim big, I don't mean in terms of like notoriety or, or reputation, but when you sit alone, uh, when you sleep or before you sleep, what's the idea that makes you smirk? What's mm -hmm. the idea that like, oh, makes you curious that's how you know that's the one that you go with all right brother i had a blast man yeah i gotta get back to daddy mode all right so i'll just do a quick outro thank you guys for listening um this was a great episode and uh if you want to check out um crew yai nick bautista you can check him out at brampton muay thai in brampton um Part of the Trinity Health Collective, where they offer many, many different services, and I just—it's just a great place all around. So, um, thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week.